Shinrix Cars is actually a pretty fascinating industry. So, um, yeah, so I'll be talking about Shiny. It's a little bit of a, uh, I gave, was anybody at this talk last year? Okay, so there'll be a lot of repeat for you, <laughs> unfortunately, but um, it's a little bit of a French talk. You know, I felt weird. They asked, uh, I'm a co-organizer of the Twin Cities R user group as well, and, you know, to come to something like Google Dev Fest. I'm not a programmer. I'm a mechanical engineer, so this is sort of just a hobby, or hobby side interest of mine. Um, I really enjoy programming, but just with the job that I do, you know, I'm not a web developer. I have time to do things like this um, all the time. So, um, so this will be mostly an intro. I'm, we'll focus more on examples just to try to show you what Shiny can do and hopefully entice you to perhaps play around with it. Um, just out of curiosity, how many people have used R? Does anybody not have never even heard of R? Cool. Um, so yeah, so I, I added some stuff because I feel like you can't talk about doing interactive graphics with R, this sort of maybe clunky or pretty odd language, I think. Uh, the syntax can be a little bit odd for people at first. Um, so, you know, it has some odd uh, nuances to it that at least were confusing to me. Maybe that's just because, again, I'm not a programmer, so I don't have a ton of languages. I just took a Java class um, at St. Thomas where I went to college um, in mechanical engineering. <coughs> Um, and really, at its heart, it's for statistics. It's a statistical programming language, I guess, is how it would define itself. Um, and I feel like R has a little bit of a reputation like Emacs. Like, it's just this really heavy, can do anything. You know, there's so many add ons and, and packages and libraries. So that can make it maybe not as friendly for something optimized. Like, for example, I've heard Google um, uses R pretty heavily for early development, but they're not going to scale something up in R. They're going to write it in Python or whatever, what, whatnot. So, um, for me, this just was a nice fit because I feel like with my programming inclinations, I, I love trying to integrate some of that into my job as much as I can because it's sort of a cheater way to build a new skill while still getting my work done. So at 3M, Minitab is sort of the statistical program of uh, choice or what they provide. Um, but I like to use Linux as much as I can and I just hate it. I don't like working with binary files and um, you know, store most of my data in CSV, and so I don't have the need for Minitab, nor do I really like um, just having to fire up Minitab, say every time sends me a file, or, or if I want to do an analysis for somebody, having to do it in, in that context. Um, Cross-platform consistency, so if I do have to use some fringe application that 3M still only allows Internet Explorer to work for, and I boot into Windows, and I don't feel like rebooting back into Linux, um, I can fuss around um, in Windows and do the same work there's some really good plotting uh, libraries, which is a lot of what I do, collecting data and then trying to summarize it for a team <coughs> to make decisions. Um, love the data manipulation, so I think when I first started R, that stuff can be a little bit harder to get into, so I was mostly interested in how do I represent data visually, um, and so I would do all my manipulation in something like Excel, get the data in the right format, but then as I picked it up, I mean R can do some, I think they're pretty ridiculous things in terms of, um, well, that would get, Two and two, but those packages and functions are awesome. So melt and, and dbplot, for example, are subsetting particular sets of data frame according to criteria. And like I said, there's a very large package repository for doing very statistical techniques. Um, so okay, so it's for statistics, but why in the world would you use it for web graphics? So again, maybe this is a fringe thing that only applies to me. But so I learned this language, and now um, our studio released a library called Shiny, which lets you do interactive web graphics. So for me, it's a bonus because this is really the only programming language I have developed some proficiency with and use on a daily basis. So even better that I can just uh, leverage this library to make web graphics rather than um, you know something like D3, which I love and would want to learn someday, but just realistically, I don't have as much experience. Um, whereas R, I get to use all the time, so I'm a lot more familiar with it. So that may not resonate with you uh, to pick up a new language just to do something you could do in JavaScript if you already know it, but uh, for me that was kind of a nice niche. So I find it really nice for prototypes, uh, visualizations, and sketches, um, exploratory analysis, which I'll show you some examples of. Uh, yeah, so I'll just dive in, I guess. So, so like I said, yeah, I think that covers that. Um, this is on GitHub. I don't care if you go now and want to clone stuff or feel free to play around. Um, I won't be offended. Uh, but it is on GitHub, and so is last year's version. Last year was a sort of a combined talk where I uh, 
showed how to use some geospatial data in R as well, um, which is pretty neat. So it has some nice tools for getting latitude, longitude coordinates or extracting maps from Google. That actually seemed like a better fit last year because you can leverage the Maps API and, and uh, get snapshots or different zoom levels and then overplot uh, with ggplot. So, um, so unfortunately, you can't, so I start talking about R because you can't do anything in Shiny that if you can't do it in R first. So if you're familiar with something like Spotfire where you just load in, it's another statistical visualization application. So if you load in a file, it kind of gives you this um, intuitive, maybe a drop down for every column of your data. So you don't really have to do anything. You just say, here's the data, and it will sort of try to interpret how you might want to visualize it. And you can choose the chart type. Oh, I want to make a scatter plot or um, bar chart with this is the x variable, this is the y variable, or gobi is another similar one like that, um, where it just sort of doing the exploration for you. So Shiny's not like that. You're just taking our code that you would write locally and adding some interactive features to let the user um, interface with it. So um, there's two main files you need, and I think this may be outdated. I believe I've seen sort of a nested setup now where you can kind of write it all in one file, but this still works. And so you're going to need R, you're also going to need R Studio, which is how Shiny runs. Um, so that's what you would do to install those. And this is sort of minimal UI, so this is going to define your user interface side, so it's going to set up a page. Um, you know, you've got a, some sort of a title. There's usually a sidebar on the left where you're going to have your inputs, the things that the user's going to interact with, and then some type of output. So if it's a plot, it's plot output. You can do tables that update dynamically if you're changing that the user is selecting. Um, and there's lots of these that are really well doc documented on the Shiny web page. And then your server file is going to do sort of all the backend stuff, data processing. What did the user select? Okay, extract a subset of the data based on that and then create the resultant um, plot. So if you use those minimal files, you get something like this. Not too uh, exciting, but we have our sidebar. We just didn't define anything to go in it. And this is uh, on the right is the area that your plot would appear. So um, there are lots of choices, so I probably most of your standard HTML type inputs, checkboxes, whatever. Um, they've got file uploads now. I haven't played with that, but that's pretty neat. If, um, there's some catches there where maybe you'd have to account for what format the user's data is in, but if you specify that, they could upload their own file and then leverage your tool to uh, explore it in that way. And then there's lots of outputs, uh, pop, uh, types as well, so not just plots and city even rendered Markdown or HTML. Um, so here's one example. Uh, I was um, uh, going to that. So I found some transportation data. There's a, a sister site of Stack Overflow called Skeptics.StackExchange where people will just post questions like, usually in the form of, does X really mean that Y, or does this imply that, whatever. So somebody posted this question, is public transportation really more efficient than uh, most people driving around. And, and it seems like, well, of course it is. You know, buses would be a better way to go, or trains, or any type of mass transit should be more fuel efficient. And um, so I got curious about that and thought, OK, how would I answer this question? Turns out there's some really cool data out there from the National Transportation Database. And they collect statistics from all of the public transportation organizations in the US about how many passengers they had on average. Um, what type of fuel they use, some are on electric, some are on biodiesel, diesel, whatever, um, and how many miles they travel, what population they serve. It was a really interesting data set. I started trying to explore, but it's, it's huge, and there's, uh, it's not apparent what the relationships might be. So you could do some, you know, maybe linear models to try to figure out correlated variables or, or whatever, but um, mostly I put this together for the talk, but I thought, okay, this would be one cool way. Could I make something where you could sort of look at x versus y combinations interactively rather than maybe having to iteratively generate all these plots just to try to, to see what you're, what you're dealing with. So um, the link there, I think, is to the question on stack exchange. Uh, and at the time, I had done it in Excel just with a simple bar chart summarizing by state. And it turned out there's only five states on average that are better than the average uh, single car or, or occupancy, if that makes sense. So. They have statistics on that too, of like you know how many people drive singly, two people in a car, etc. Um, and 
so the, the measurement is BTUs per passenger mile. So how much energy does it take to, to move one person one mile? And if you compare that on state averages, they're actually pretty bad. So I got curious, like, why is that? You know, and I would have expected maybe California and New York to do awesome, where you have really um, defined infrastructure. But it wasn't that simple. Minnesota is actually like the, the last one before the um, before the cutoff where cars are. So. So this is what I wrote. So it's got the data loaded in the background, and I just made some simple drop downs. So these represent all the columns in my data. Um, so right now it's not very interesting with population versus population. So you get a linear relationship. Um, the variable I'm generally interested in is this BTUs per passenger mile. Uh, so now we get a plot there, and there's some outliers. So that got me interesting. You know, you can. Pass ggplot, which is the plotting library that's being used here, it has built-in parameters to accept scaling um, types. So, you know, you can apply a log scale to sort of uh, spread everything out. You can also pass it some variable to use for the color. Um, and I'm using one that I kind of know there's a relationship. Um, so this one, you know, I find pretty interesting. So the, the higher it is, the less efficient it is. Um, and these are going to be a little bit confusing. For sure, like VP is Vanpool, so you can see most of your pink is definitely at the lower end of the spectrum. Um, but this is just an example of where you could play around with different combinations or different. Uh, you know, you could have a size variable in here. Um, I tend to find that seems to like clutter it up a little bit, and there's a little bit of difficulty with adjusting your your uh, relative min versus max size range appropriately. Um, so let's leave that out for now. Um, but you know, van pools are down there, and they're, you know, that's an interesting thing. So van pools tend to be, somebody's picking up a group of people at a gas station, driving them directly to the destination, returning them to a common drop-off point, and then they leave. So maybe some missing aspects of the data is how far did each person drive to the gas station first, uh, for example, or the pickup location. Um, and buses are just all over the place. So, um, but it's pretty, you know, I find it flexible and just a uh, way if you have a complicated data set. Um, I guess one of the examples I just want to highlight is how you could use this for kind of personal initial exploration, and then maybe you find a couple relationships that you want to pursue, pursue further. Or it saves you from having to write every permutation of linear model just, just to look, uh, whereas visually it can stand out a lot more clearly and more intuitively. Um, so that's one example. Um, another one I was working with some machine learning on tape data, um, trying to apply it to adhesives, and you know, you end up with all these predictors and a couple of responses, let's say. So the common test is put tape on a piece of glass and peel it off at a known rate and measure the force. Um, it's kind of your stickiness value. Um, and there's a lot of inputs that go into that. What's the molecular weight of the adhesive? What type of adhesive? There's different components in the adhesive. Um, and so you can end up with it's just hard to portray all of those variables in one place. So if you want to simulate what it would be like to vary input one and input two, maybe you have other four other predictors, you need to hold those constant at some value to do something like a contour plot, because those aren't shown. So those are going to be fixed, and then your axes are going to show the relationship between two predictors and the output. Um, it can also be difficult, you know, as I was generating static plots, um, how would I share this with my colleagues without having to send them like a hundred plots and talk through it or whatever? So um, this isn't the real one, but I posted on Stack Overflow about how how someone would make an interactive contour. I forget the exact challenge that I ran into here, but um, uh, this maybe look better. See, and you can change the plot type as well. So these are just things that are being passed to ggplot in the background. So what I liked is, um, I was actually trying to replicate a different piece of software called iSight, um, which is used for this sort of thing. And it had these sliders, which I thought were, were kind of neat. Um, so if you find an area that looks more promising with your desired output, um, so if we just assume, okay, I want my response to always be red, um, you can start tweaking those sliders and say, well, I can ignore everything where, you know, if I look at this, um, Y would be 
x3 here. I don't really need anything that low, so if I slide this up to tighten it a bit, I'm assuming that'll get more red at the bottom, fingers crossed. <laughs> and play with this as well. So, okay. So why kind of spend your time looking outside the ranges that don't make sense? Um, anyway, I, I just find it neat because you can change what the fixed value is. So anywhere that x1 is not on an axis, you need to set what the other, uh, what the formula is going to be with that held constant. It's just another way to have a lot of data in one place and not have to just constantly kick out all these plots. Um, a new one, uh, this is super, super new to me. I literally just put the example together last night. Um, but there's a guy, Ramnath V. I only know him by his GitHub name. Um, but he's been doing a tremendous amount of cool stuff. And uh, Rcharts is one of them. I'll just show you the website. Um, so what he's done is take an R, so, so a Shiny is sort of a front end to allow you to use R for web graphics. Um, he's taken R and allowed you to have uh, access to all these existing JavaScript plotting libraries. Um, so you can still write, if you know R, this is a very R-ish plotting um, syntax. And in the background, he's converting data to like JSON format and then accessing um, the JavaScript libraries that are exist. So now, you know, this is embedded in the page and you're getting some interactivity. You can hover, so that's a poly chart. And that kind of gives you these R would call it facets. So, um, you know, you're always plotting the same X, Y variables, but you're grouping by some other characteristic of your data. Um, this one I think is more for time series data. I haven't played with that one. You know, and you can get some some nice visualization. And there's nothing <coughs> that, that specifies I want it to add up, animate. It's just part of the NV D3 library. Um, so I find that pretty neat. Again, maybe not your thing, but I'm coming from not being a big JavaScript guy. So for me, that's really cool. Like, oh, I've got a new tool that I can use with that with minimal overhead. Um, there's a caveat, and that if you start wanting to customize this too much, I don't think he's gotten to the point of converting every bit of our option into its analog in the library. So you will, you you do have to kind of look at the documentation for the library if you start wanting to, wanting to pass sort of more internal specific parameters. Um, I don't have a great example of that because I've literally just started playing with this in, uh, in the last week. Um, but hopefully that makes sense. You might have to get into DOM elements or just more CSSE type stuff if you want to start customizing. But out of the box, it's, it's pretty cool. And you can, <coughs> if I remove one of these, you get you know you get some auto scaling of the axes. Um, I should have done that. So, um, so that's pretty neat. And you can also that. Um, you can also embed them in Shiny. So maybe that seems a little redundant, but I'll show an example here. So um, some test equipment, <coughs> moves at different rates. I had a custom machine builder, so I specified I worked with them to build it. And we got it in, and, and I wanted to know for sure when I punch in what rate I want it to run at, what rate is it really running at. So I got a laser sensor, um, which was fun to play with, generating these just ridiculously long, um, you know, sampling two microseconds um, for every time that it was moving. And I just wanted to explore what does it look like, how consistent is it, what's the overshoot, as it ramps up to speed, etc. And there's a ramp mode as well, so it's supposed to have sort of a, a min and a max speed and then accelerate through that. Um, and I'd be watching this thing and testing tape and thinking it's just, it can't possibly be constant acceleration, but I didn't have the data at first to know that. Um, and the guy who programmed it, he didn't quite know either. He said, oh, I just know there's an option to do this ramp mode. So um, I got the data, and yes, I could generate a lot of static charts. Um, but this one, I don't know why that times out. And this is a big data set, so it takes a little bit longer. And I'm actually only sampling in the background, I'm sampling every 250th row, so I'm cutting it down pretty, pretty big. Um, but if I play along. So if I just plotted all my data, um, because I'm looking at, this is time down here in seconds, and then this is the speed that this particular machine component is moving at. Um, 
if I plot it at all like this, it's just hard to see things relative because uh, the shortest speed is like 0.5 inches a second, and it's moving about, uh, so just say 15 inches. So 30 seconds versus the fastest speed is about a meter a second, so half a, half a second for my whole time. So they're so difficult, so I was looking for a way to group them. Uh, so starting on the background, I'm defining what my groups are called, what, what, um, what, I'm, what I'm thinking is the slow group. Um, and I can also switch on and off the ramp or constant set as I label them in my data. So for every row, it says whether it's part of the ramp mode or the um, constant mode. And again, you know, I can go in there and extract. I've got, you know, an initial acceleration. So I can figure out what that is and then, um, you know, maybe decide I want to take from the 20th to the 80th portion of my data and take the mean of that to figure out how consistent it is. But for an initial um, not too hard to plot example, you know, this just lets me kind of get a sense of, okay, you know, 1.09, 0.91, okay, plus or minus maybe 10%. Um, also with And this is where I've got the shiny inputs that help, but also I get to get the little clickable on-off stuff for free um, as part of NVD3, which is going on. So that's kind of a neat way to mix both the JavaScript aspect of the library as well as the shiny. Um, you know, and just to show like one insight. So I said it wasn't constant acceleration. Like it's not. There was this definitive. And the, the more interesting thing to me, this actually gave, let me give input back to the machine builders of, okay, both of these, you actually input four speeds, um, and they're all equally spaced in this case, but for some reason, however he's got this programmed, they're both ramping to that first speed over the same amount of time and then taking off from there. So I don't know why that is, but I'm assuming maybe by telling him this, he can go in his mind and think, oh, okay, I know why that is, and, and fix it. Um, but I would not have. Known that, known that intuitively, or, or how, how this is behaving. So, um, so that's been kind of fun, um, I guess for me. I don't haven't used it a, tr a tremendous amount in depth, but um, I just think it's a neat library that I hope to explore a lot more in the future. Um, and you know, maybe moving on, Threem's got some internal hosting. So I think again, the shareability aspect is pretty neat. Um, and you don't even need Shiny in this case. You can use our charts by itself and just send somebody a. HTML, uh, HTML file or host it. Um, so that's more on the work work side. Um, and this is my, this is like my prized shiny development. So I got really interested in, well, I've always been interested in analyzing things and trying to come up with a conclusion <coughs> and benefit plans, like initially, the, I don't know, that I, I just didn't think about it too much, and then it struck me, there's, things are actually sort of complicated to figure out. It's not intuitive, you know, when you see, here's your deductible, here's your premium, where's the cost-benefit analysis, how do I get the most bang for my buck, kind of. Um, so, Thram releases these every year, here's what the plan criteria are, and I wanted to, you know, I get in discussions, at first I was doing it in an Excel spreadsheet, and I kind of knew, okay, Pretty sure this one plan is like never advantageous. I don't even know why they offer it, um, but it's the lowest deductible plan. So I get in conversations with other people and try to sway them and say, "Well, I simulated all these ranges of possible expenses. You know, from nothing up to like fifty thousand dollars. You know, maybe if you had a surgery, and this one plan is never better for you. And it, it, you just can't wrestle with, yeah, but it's got a five hundred dollar deductible, and this other one is twenty four hundred dollars. Like, how in the world is it not better? So." Visualization, I find, can kind of cut through that and just let somebody look, you know, hey, here's all the data, here's the formulas they used, go for it. Um, so, you know, yeah, you usually get something glossy in the mail, looks really pretty, um, and, you know, maybe here's your, here's a theoretical criteria. So you have different premiums per month. Um, 3M may, in some cases, contribute to an HSA, so you get some free money to apply towards your health care. The deductibles are pretty different. Um, out-of-pocket maximums aren't that different, which one's better, you know, and I don't know that many people could look at the chart and figure that out. Um, so, um, you know, and they always have a picture like that, too, you know, 
how happy it is to make a benefits choice. Um, and it's not been my experience that most people look like that when they're thinking about these things. <laughs> so back then, you know, we have a pretty simple case. We, we know the relationship of uh, before you hit your deductible, you're paying in full. Then in the next phase, 3M is covering everything. In my case, at 90%, you know, is what the plan does. And then once you hit your out-of-pocket maximum, you this is uh, scaled in a little bit, but there would be a part where that plateaus. Your costs don't increase no matter how far on the uh, right axis or on the x-axis you go, which is what I'm calling a sort of a, what they tell you to pay. So you get a bill for some service, but you're only paying 10% after your deductible, and then um, at some point you won't pay anymore. So two years later, now they have some plans with these split criteria. So there's an individual deductible. Let's say you're on a family plan. This wouldn't apply if you're just an employee. But you're on a family plan, and if one person hits half of the total deductible, that person is covered at 90%. But the other members of the plan have to make up the remaining half of the total deductible. And if it sounds confusing, it is. Um, so. Now you have some multi-variable stuff going on, multiple criteria. Um, you know, you would need to check if you're trying to simulate expenses. I can't just plot them over the whole range. I need to know. Well, what do you think the top spender would spend? And is that person above the individual deductible? If so, he's covered. But do the other people match the second half? If they didn't, then they're going to keep paying in full. Um, and if they did, then everybody's covered now at, at 90 percent. So. Um, before the world of shiny, I thought, okay, multiple variables, contour plot. So on the bottom axis, I have what the highest spender would pay, and on the y-axis, I have what everybody else would pay. And so you can kind of imagine you're climbing stairs. So this is sort of like a, like a side of a of stairs kind of coming up together. So if you just go to the right, you're rising at, um, you're paying in full, and then you hit that deductible, and now this person, your highest spender, can see the lines change from this to this. So now he's only going up at a 10% slope, whereas everybody else is going to have to climb up to this plateau here before they get um, 10%. And again, if that's confusing, it's because it is, and ContraPlus sort of sucked at um, visualizing something like this. So I thought, okay, well, there's three plans. What if I took all the contour plots, like imagine mountains with different topography, and you could stack them all on top of each other, and for everywhere in your surface, let's just find the lowest point, and I'll color it that color. So we have plans A, B, and C, and now based on your combination of who is going to spend the most in your family and everybody else, you can find an X, Y point and say that's the plan that's best. And this um, this A plan is kind of the one where I suspected it's not it's not really ever advantageous. It turned out I was wrong. There's a little island where it's it's quite nice. But it's pretty high, so maybe most people wouldn't be interested in that range of thinking they'll spend twenty to thirty thousand. So then Shiny comes out, and I see it for the first time, and I think, this is it. i, I got to do this. Because um, I was already wrestling with that here. You can see which plan is the best, but a lot of people want to do a little bit of a risk analysis. So let's say I think I'll be here, and really I end up over here. How bad is it that I'm in a red zone when I thought I was going to be in a green zone? Um, and so um, there was a library at the time called Play With, where you could sort of run it locally and hover your mouse, and it would some points, uh, but it wasn't great and definitely not shareable. I mean, somebody would have had to install it, know how to use R, and, and get going that way. So um, I wanted I wanted to cover all the plans. So even though I just do employee versus family, and definitely it's something I, I like doing to try to help other people make this decision. Because decent chunk of change that's involved. So I wanted people to be able to say how many people are on your plan, what type of plan. Because there's employee, employee spouse, employee plus children and then employee plus family and um, thankfully there's sort of an analytics group in 3M so they had an instance of shiny server so they were able to host it inside the um, firewall I guess. I don't think that should be necessary but HR seemed sensitive about um, revealing like what their plan coverages are. Um, anyway, yeah, which, which again it's not confidential like I kind of, because I, I inquired can I present this at an R meetup group Oh, that's kind of confidential, and I responded with, well, should I hide the documents he sent to my house from my wife, because she's not a, a 3M employee at all, he'll send it to her, so. Um, 
So that was internally, and then I kind of anonymized some values and just tweaked them a little bit and put it on um, shiny apps, which I'll talk about in a, in a little bit. Um, and this is why it's complicated. So there's kind of went through and had to figure out what are all the different permutations of cutoffs that somebody would have to satisfy. Um, and that was just how I thought about it, was in sort of this table of, okay, did you, you know, going down each column, did you meet the individu individual deductible? Did you hit the individual out of pocket? Um, did the rest of your family meet the remaining deductible or the remaining out of pocket? And then did the total group hit either of those criteria as well? Um, and those are sort of the unique cases. So I posted this, again, I rely on Stack Overflow a lot when I'm out of my element, and I said, how, one year I did this all in just if-else statements, and it was absolutely horrible. And I said, what, what would I do different? And somebody said, oh, what you've got looks sort of like a truth table. Um, and somebody at some point mentioned binary, and I thought, okay, that's interesting. Like each row, um, if you treat it like a different two to the column number, you get a different sum, a unique sum of, of um, results. So, so what I did is, um, you know, created a, this is just a vector, if you're familiar with that, or just literally like a list of, you know, think of it as different cells in a table if you're not familiar with that. Um, so two, I needed two each, so two for the, how much the individual's gonna spend, how much the remaining people were forecasted to spend, and then how much the total spent, and then I compared that against the different cutoffs, so these would be specific for the plan um, that I'm looking at, and then, um, I don't know if this is probably possible in other languages, but ours may be somewhat neat in that you can be a little bit liberal with your um, variable classes. So when I compare this test case and to see if it's above the limits, I'm gonna get a vector of true-false data. Um, and maybe other languages are like that too, but it, ours is cool with thinking of that as just one and zero, so you don't have to do a you know, secondary step. And this is sort of just a matrix multiplication of two to the power that I want, so um, super ugly. <laughs> but this is a, a hacky way to define, you know, for each of those binary unique numbers I'm gonna get, I've defined a function that corresponds to it. There probably, there has to be a better way, I'm sure. Um, but in R you can just have lists and they can contain whatever. So this is a list of functions, and when I find my binary sum, I say, well, which function corresponds to that? You know, 17, and then I can call that particular function for that criteria. Um, so yeah, enough about that. <laughs> uh, so this is what I came up with. Uh, there's still some aspects of it I'm not super happy with, um, but for a first go, I was pretty happy. So <clears throat> you can choose your plan type. Um, so I'll just go with the employee plus family. Uh, there was a link, I think, on a, a previous slide to dynamic UI elements. So right now, if we just look at what's available, you can, this will also come into play, so you can have a, an amount of come out of your paycheck tax-free that goes into an HSA or HCRA. And right now you just have that. Um, you know, for most people, I'm, I was thinking, this just sets the max of the, this slider down here. <clears throat> so for a lot of people, maybe $5,000 is a reasonable limit. But if somebody knew they were having a surgery, that wouldn't be possible. So you want to kind of bump up, like what are what are you able to say is the is the max down here? I left it at five thousand because I don't know how to scale the spacing, and it can get a little cramped to try to be grabbing two sliders when they're so close. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, and if I choose employee and family, now it says um, how many people are on your plan. So. Down a slider for each person. So whether that was the best route or not, but I, I just thought it'd be fun for people to kind of just go in and rough it out, you know, because nobody really ever knows what they're in for. And you can say, well, most of the time I spend nothing, um, but if I do a work, you know, do the worm while drunk at a wedding and bust my chin on the dance floor, need some stitches, that never happened. Um, maybe I'll be looking at like fifteen hundred dollars, um, you know, for an ER trip or something like that. So. You can kind of account for for some variability, um, and again, some of this is a little rough with how you set because this is set a little bit manually what your tick values are. So sometimes it can get a little bit cramped. Um, and let me just make it a little more interesting. Okay. 
So in each case, in the background, I'm taking the left slider value for all the pairs and I'm running it through my criteria. And for each plan, I'm showing you the premiums never change. That's just what it is for the plan. Um, the red are your um, are what you would have to pay. So that's your total for the year. So you're gonna not see really the. And that's another thing that people overlook is it doesn't. To me, it never feels like I'm paying premiums because I never see them. They just come out of my paycheck. Um, but your net cost for both plans is going to be the staff result. So you had to pay for it and you had to pay some amount for care. Um, but two of these plans have HSA money from 3M plus whatever you would put in optionally. So in this case, I'm not showing. I'm saying I'm contributing zero. So this is just the 3M money. So what I wanted to do is kind of have that. Let me slide that back to zero. And you'll see the green will grow. So it's not really, you can't use it for whatever you want. It's like you can't go buy a boat with your extra HSA money. But it is, you do carry it over from year to year. So I want people to know that that value is there. Um, in your best case, if you don't have any expenses, you're going to bank that money for future years. And that'll be a nice buffer. Um, and in the cases where you do use it, but you don't use all of it, I'm going through and I'm saying, well, what were your total expenses? And it's turning pink because I'm trying to represent that you're able to pay that with your HSA. So it's not sort of a felt impact. And then the, the green just grows. And so once the green grows to zero, then you start seeing these stack up here. So some money that you're able to pay with your HSA, and then the rest is going to be on you. Um, and again, I don't know that these values are the best, but I wanted to have some representation of, in your best case scenario, how much better or worse off would you be on one plan versus the other. Um, so maybe compared to max wasn't the best, maybe I should have done compared to all, all of them or something and run all those numbers. Um, but you can see, you know, you would save a net of $2,400 to $4,000 if you spent nothing. So basically it would be way over spending for plan A. Um, and then if it was your worst case, you know, they switch a little bit so they get a little bit closer, you're still saving. And if I played with the values, you'd see B sort of ends up being the overall winner. Um, and there's some criteria for C that make it more appealing if you are pretty sure you're going to have low expenses. And in this case, I really did run out, I think, all the way up to like $100,000, and A is never a better plan, so I still haven't figured out why they offer it. Um, which bothers me because it's the most intuitively luring, because it has such a low, I think it's a $700 deductible. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people I think are baited for that because they haven't looked into it. So, so I post this, and then somebody starts making the case, um, well, the HSA money is treated differently. So on plan A, if I'm contributing $2,000 a year to my HCRA, which you can't carry over, so there's some other nuances there, 3M gives it to you all in the beginning of the year. So even though it's coming out of your paycheck, let's just say $2,400. $200 is coming out of your paycheck monthly, but on January 1st, they say, here, all the $2,400 is here for you to spend, and you're sort of paying them back throughout the year. On the other plans, you only get it as your paycheck withdrawal happens. So if you did $2,400 in January, you have 200 available to use, et cetera, et cetera. So somebody said, well, maybe you're in a cash flow situation where if you had something bad happen in January, you really can't absorb that and pay yourself back. You need to rely on that. So then, um, so I tried to simulate that, and I thought, okay, sure, like how bad would that, um, could that end up being? And again, I like to fine tune these, but the blue down here is trying to represent your HSA money. So as that sort of gets gobbled up, it's going to go to zero, and you're going to see the slopes of the expenses rise. So that's what happens over here. You used up your HSA money pretty early by February, and then uh, you know you can get some line crossing here and there. There are scenarios where if I can pick one out. There are. There's definitely some scenarios where these lines do cross. Um, so it'll, the blue line, for example, will spike up um, initially. Oh, maybe I need to have some pages. Oh, it's getting closer. OK, so that's not a great example, but there, there's some plots like that that came out when I was exploring. Where, yeah, he was right. There's definitely some scenarios where you're going to peak um, because you're having so much expense in the early part of the year and then pay yourself back. Um, 
but it also helps you be a little bit more objective about it. So that's fine, but I just want people to be conscious that they're making that decision. So I want to save, say, $600 in June so that I can lose a net of like $2,400 by the end of the year, because that's where you're going to land. So this is still going to show you your ultimate position. Um, so I still don't know that it's the most rational decision, but yeah, there could be cases like that. Um, and then I just threw on one more to that. Well, what happens if all of the expenses come in January? So now you're seeing yourself on blue and green be sort of paid back throughout the year, um, whereas red had all that money available at the beginning of the year. So red is literally only rising because the premiums are so much more um, because all the expenses hit here in January, and these are sort of coming down because you're actually reimbursing yourself. So your net impact is less. So um, I don't know that I talk about that the best, but it's a because it's a it's a complicated. Financial, I mean, just, it's a complicated interaction, but this is one way um, we just had some fun using this library to try to help others make some decisions. There's some great examples um, on the web. I mean, if you go to that Shiny, uh, there's a user gallery, and some people are kind of constantly updating what they've done. Um, I guess one other thing to state, so this is running on, oh, this isn't running where I thought it was. Um, anyway, this is running on an R Studio server, and what's really going on in the background is you are giving your input and sending that value to the server. It's updating based on your code. It's generating the plot as an image, and then it's sending it back to the web page. So it's not interactive in the sense that JavaScript would be, where it's all running locally and happening there, um, or in in the in the JavaScript itself. It's it's just a static image that's sort of being sent back and forth. So for that reason, I found, you know, you saw it took a little bit to load. Sometimes, especially this, uh, this guy, which is no, kind of, they kind of go to sleep. But that one, I think there's something like, it's a 68 megabyte CSV file. So I mean, there's a lot of data in it. I think it's like 840,000 rows, which isn't big data necessarily, but it's, it can take a bit to chug along. And I found that our charts can be even a little bit slower, because I think there's a lot of things going on in the background where it's converting to maybe JSON or um, just doing a lot of translation there. So, um, all right. So yeah, maybe they were smiling because they're playing with Shiny, and that helped them make a better decision. Um, so you've got your app, and now you want to share it somehow. If you are working with fellow R users, you can just send them some archive, and they can run it locally. Um, Shiny Server is an option that's on GitHub, and you can run that uh, on a local machine. Or there's a free account at Shiny Shiny Apps. So I mean, you can sign up pretty easily. There's a free version which does have some. Okay, I should have paid attention to that application limit. I think I'm at five now. So I mean, I can't do too much more, and I was a little hazy on this active hours, so if you guys all get really interested and start playing around with everything, you know, they might kick me out for a month or something <laughs> until my hours reset, I don't know. Um, so that's, that's another option for hosting publicly. Um, and it's pretty neat, it used to be that you would log into the server in an interactive R Studio session and kind of create your files while logged in remotely. Now you can just do them on your own computer and then just type this command deploy app and it just takes everything in that working directory and, and sets it up. Um, and it will give you nice errors if there's like a library missing or um, syntax errors. I find that's a lot nicer because I tended to prototype a lot of my own computer, think I had everything right, then go to upload it, then you find some issue and it's a little bit harder once it's running in the server to figure out what's going on, whereas you can debug locally a lot easier. So yeah, this is a tutorial for Shiny, which I think is, they do a really good job just walking through with some basic examples. And, um, and I think to reiterate one last time, if there's any point to this talk, it's not really this stuff is that cool that I've done. It's more to give you hope that a mechanical engineer with very little programming uh, experience can pick this stuff up. And I just think the tools have made it a lot more easy for me to leverage some of that, even though, again, I think you know some of the things going on in New York Times with D3 and it's definitely where I want to go, but uh, this has been a nice medium ground. Um, there's a mailing list, um, you can request things there. There's some Stack Overflow questions on things that I wrestled with and wasn't exactly sure. Uh, Winston Chang is another organizer for the 
our user group, and he works with our studio, so um, he's very knowledgeable and um, he's a great guy to have around in Minnesota. Um, there's links to the apps, and again, that's all in GitHub, and I included the app repository, so if you cloned this, you would be able to open it up in our studio and just run it. carryover for stuff I show work of um, using open source software and reproducibility. So, uh, has anybody heard of org mode? Emacs org mode? It's on. I'd love to give a talk on that sometime. That's actually what I write everything for work in. And you can, it, it's similar to um, our markdown in our studio where you can intersperse, I guess, with pros, you know, some technical writing and then say, you know, as a result of this, we can take a look at the following chart and then I can have. R code right there, generate my plots um, and include them in, generally I do PDF, so it's going through LaTeX. But it's a very markdowny syntax, so you don't have to learn all that either. Um, so, and then Beamers tends to be pretty obvious, so I tried to hide that from you. This is a Beamer presentation. Yeah, that's what I have. Um, I don't know if there's any questions or, is that all helpful, interesting? This is anecdotal because of this slide, but are you actually running Arch Linux on a laptop? I was. I had a little bit of trouble. I came early, went to present, and it was cutting my... I could do a dedicated monitor, and it showed my full slide. Um, but then when I tried to duplicate so that I could see what the heck I was doing, it didn't. So then I, I had to rely on rebooted Windows 7, gotcha. the dreaded. Well, my follow-up question was, how many hours a week do you devote to keeping your laptop working with Arch Linux? Well, <laughs> hardly any. Really? Yeah. Uh, it's one of those things where it can kind of build up, you know, it'll, you'll update some things and some config files, but it's pretty smart about that, so it won't overwrite the working one. It'll just say, like, uh, gotcha. you know, fstab.packnew or something, you know, and that kind of tells you, oh, it right. thinks it should be updated, but it's not going to force you to until you get to it. Um, there have been many hours, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to do less of that, but, yeah, enjoy it. How, how chatty are we talking about uh, for all of those images? Like if you had a fair number of users, let's just say 100 users internally that wanted to be able to pull up and refer to this, right. how, how much traffic? Yeah, that's a think? really good question. I'm actually not sure on that. How it can... But they are flat images and they could probably be compressed? Yeah, I th I'm assuming only because I've used um, our studio locally to make HTML that they're PNGs. And and if you do stuff locally with our studio, it's not really the image. Like it's not a um, like an image tag. It's literally like the image is in the HTML. If that makes sense. I, I mean, there must be some way to take a PNG and take its binary data and actually embed it in a page. So if you sent the HTML and had no image at all in the directory, it still would load. So it's it's one and the same with the HTML. Generate, so I don't know if that's how it's doing it or what it embeds them in. I haven't found the PNGs to be that big, even for pretty complex stuff. Um, I do often tend to generate PDFs and maybe some of that ramp data that might be like a meg and a half or some of the more data heavy plots I've made. But I, I'm taking the PNG maybe like that's stuff that you can't, can't easily cache. Then. <coughs> yeah, not with this because you're kind of constantly changing it. <coughs> Our studio, if, if you you know, want to end up using Markdown or working within our studio, there are some, you can have code blocks and have a cached option, so just a cache equals true, and it, will, it won't rerun it as long as you don't change the code. So I think it stores like a, a hash of the, of the code block, and if that matches, it won't rerun. So that's, that's nice when you're exporting, it yeah. just takes a long time to check through a bunch of blocks. Yeah, I think ours is cool. It is clunky. I want to learn Python, but for now it's for now uh, it's working well. And we've got a user group. What's that? So we've yeah, got a user group. Yep, there it is. And I just, um, yeah. I was kind of curious. I saw with the, uh, the laser data. Mm -hmm. There's quite a bit of jitter in there. Is that actually is that legitimate jitter, or is that just from like just random errors and you can smooth that out? Like, it would be that laser sensor is. I mean, so, I've looked when it was sitting. Um, you know, before the move started. So that's kind of what I did is I had a, a, an amount of lag for every, some lag and then some 
stop just sitting at the final position. Yeah. Um, and it was like dead on. I mean, really? within okay. point, so it's point actually zero under this closet. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And I haven't decided if that's a big deal yet. It's a ball screw. Um, and I'm wondering if that, I actually was thinking about that recently. Like, gosh, does, a, does that periodicity translate to the flights on the, on the screw it's using? I, I don't know. I'm inclined to think, yeah, 10% isn't great, but it's, for what it's doing, there's some more, um, a lot lower speed testers at 3M that probably don't have that, but I think the pitch on the screw is a lot finer. So, yeah, and that's all stuff that comes out of, it. the biggest thing that came out to me was the overshoot on some of these ramped mode, or the fastest. And again, I'm sampling pretty, pretty bad here, so this yeah. looks not necessarily smoother, you just see a lot more of the of the noise okay. is just kind of jerking along, um, but this bothered me a lot more, you know, because it's going up. And I think this is even higher in the raw data. It just depends on since I'm doing a random 250th. Oh sure. Does it have like feedback controls in there? Or? Um, no, I don't think it does. Oh. But I want. I, de I definitely pass that along to the, the guy running it because my time is so short here. I mean, you're seeing I'm done. Basically, I'm decelerating in a half a second. So if I'm spending two thirds of that overshooting, undershooting, and then settling, I'm not really getting the data that I want. So if you can't fix it, then I just probably won't use that test. But um, yeah, that definitely was a insight that came out of starting to look at that. Slideify is a way to turn our mark down into a presentation kind of kind of like I'm doing with Beaver, so. Um, 